Colt 45 wants to target its new high-octane beer to young urban black men. This Philadelphia minister says take your billboards to some other neighborhood. But this marketing professor says African Americans can't keep shifting the blame to advertisers. The debate today. Plus, Lieutenant Frank Drebin is at it again. The movie buff takes aim at the naked gun two and a half. Hi, everybody. I'm Wally Kennedy. We are live from City Line Avenue on this Monday morning. The big story on the front page of USA Today is our big story about high alcohol content malt liquor and does it belong in the marketplace? We'll get into that in a moment. First, our headliners. Good morning, Liz. Good morning, Wally, and good morning to you. And topping our headliners this morning, USA Today also reports this morning that actor Michael Landon is in a very weak state following a round of chemotherapy treatments. Landon's publicist, Harry Flynn, says this is, and I quote, the long, awful period for the actor, who was diagnosed with liver and pancreatic cancer in April. Flynn says that Landon stays pretty much in bed and can't leave the house. Another reason Landon can't leave his house is a pack of paparazzi who are camped outside of his door 24 hours a day. In other news, Princess Diana marks her 30th birthday today. The 30-something royal has not planned a formal party, but she will attend a luncheon to benefit a proposed children's hospice. Pop star Phil Collins is slated to entertain at the affair, and his spokeswoman promises that happy birthday will be included among the selections. Now, later in the show, I'll be back with a review of the film that bounced Robin Hood out of the box office lead this weekend, Naked Gun Two and a Half. But first, Wally, good morning. Good morning, Liz. Thank you very much for those stories. Is, is the freedom that all of us wish to have and we will celebrate toward the end of the week also the freedom to make a bad choice or an ill-informed choice that's the big question as we come to you this morning and it has to do with a malt liquor that is going to be on the market soon hopefully according to its makers g heileman in philadelphia the question about why this should or should not be on the market is a very appropriate one because regular beer is 3.5 percent alcohol this malt liquor it's 5.9% alcohol, almost double its alcoholic content. It is primarily and almost exclusively, from a marketing point of view, focused toward African-American men. That really gets Reverend Jesse Brown angry. Who is he? He is a pastor who has been around this track before with Uptown Cigarettes. He's a Lutheran minister at Christ's Evangelical Lutheran Church in Philadelphia, also one of the founding members of the National Association of African Americans for Positive Imagery. But if it's a free marketplace and you should have the right to make a decision, no matter how ill-informed that decision may be, What's wrong with it, says Dr. Jerome Williams. He is a Penn State Associate Professor for Marketing, who, by the way, got his doctoral degree writing a thesis on marketing to African Americans. So we welcome them both today in Philadelphia. What's wrong with it? Oh, there's lots of things wrong with it, but I guess one of the critical things that is, that is wrong with it is that we have a responsibility to protect each other and to see that those things that are brought into the African-American community and into our society are beneficial and in some way aid us rather than destroy us. African-Americans die from cirrhosis of the liver disproportionate to the Caucasian population, correct? That's correct. African Americans die disproportionate of lung cancer to the Caucasian population, correct? Mm -hmm. However, if, if freedom is what this is all about and what this week is all about and certainly what the civil rights struggle has been all about, is there not also the freedom to make a choice that might be stupid? But there are also other freedoms and one of those freedoms also is the right for communities to decide not to accept a particular product and for a consensus to be formed around that decision. Uh, we so often talk about freedom purely from a personal point of view rather than from a community or a corporate uh, uh, point of view. And those freedoms, too, uh, can be used to fight or to stop or to change the way in which products are marketed to us. Okay. Okay, doctor, jump in here. Uh, the problem with that logic you see is what? Well, the problem is that the black community has struggled for years to obtain certain freedoms, the freedom to vote, the freedom to live in certain neighborhoods, the freedom to go to certain schools. And I maintain that there's also the freedom to choose in the marketplace. There are sometimes uh, ill-informed or bad decisions, as you mentioned, that are made, 
But with any freedom comes responsibility, the responsibility to be educated and informed and to make the proper decision. Are you troubled by the notion that not only, let's not just say G. Heilman, because all the major brewing companies, to one degree or another, have marketed a malt liquor primarily to the African-American community. Are you troubled by the notion that, first of all, the packs are a lot more wallop than beer? Beer is about 3.5% alcohol. This is 5.9. There are some that go up to 7 point something. Isn't there the notion, though, there of exploitation? Well, what marketers are doing, they're ba following basic marketing principles. They're saying, where is their demand? Uh, you go to a ball game, and what do you see at stadiums? You see uh, billboards for alcohol, because that's where there is demand, people that go to sporting events. If you look in certain age groups, or you look in certain segments of the population, marketers will look where there are heavy users of the product, and so they just gravitate toward that market and use a lot of advertising promotion to basically to capitalize on that. From a marketing point of view, does that promotion work? Well, it, it, it certainly does work because uh, they are taking advantage of demand that's there in the marketplace. Okay. Well, I would disagree with the point that, that they are necessarily uh, going where they believe demand is. Marketers can also create a demand. And in many of our black communities across America, um, 60, 70, as high as 80 and 90 percent of all uh, outdoor advertising uh, is advertising tobacco or alcohol products. That in itself is a way in which they can create a demand, even if a demand never existed in the beginning. Well, first of all, you have to realize that when you talk about demand, uh, there is this personal responsibility. If we're concerned about that, rather than attack the problem from the supply side, then I say instill the values in people. And, and I've seen that happen in communities all across the country, inner city communities, where people have uh, boycotted certain products, and they have a responsibility to do that, and I agree with that. But there's a notion of, of a, a boardroom full primarily of white, Anglo-Saxon, gray-haired males sitting there saying, and in this market, this segment of the market, the African-American young community, we have had a smash hit with such and such malt liquor, and actually the true benefactors, the true benefactors of this are the company's stockholders and the fat cats who live on the good side of town. Well, there's no question that they will benefit, but it, you know, I don't buy the argument that this is a racism uh, element involved in this decision. Because if you look at what's actually happening there, marketers are targeting their product by using black-owned ad agencies. Uh, they're using uh, companies that uh, specialize in developing billboards. Uh, if you look at where the ads are placed, black magazines, Ebony, Jet, uh, newspapers, Philadelphia Tribune, Primarily, media that are circulated in the black community are the media that they use to reach the black community. But the argument is so narrowly focused toward just tobacco and alcohol that it becomes a ridiculous argument. Our black newspapers, magazines are not getting advertising of Pampers. And even some of these other companies who create the tobacco and alcohol products also own other companies that they don't use those advertising dollars to advertise in the black newspapers, magazines, and ad Okay, boards. Reverend, let me, let me clarify. If you have your way, you were successful with Uptown, a cigarette that was primarily marketed to the black community, never got off the ground because, largely because of your efforts and people Correct. who were part of your coalition. If you're successful this time around, you want to do the same thing with, with uh, this malt liquor, what is it, Power, pa pa power, power Master. Master? Power Master. Do you want to keep Power Master off the market? It would be nice if Power Master would stay off the market. We do not need another high content alcoholic beverage or beverage that in any way is not going to enhance our community but destroy our community market it to us any longer hi you're on the air thanks for holding good morning Wally. good morning um i would like to say that i don't think that there's anything wrong with it because of the fact that if you're 21 you should be allowed to drink whatever you want to drink okay now um there's a stop and go around the corner from where i live at um, a little girl had got um, arrested or fined, rather, for um, buying um, a beer underage. Now, I think that if you if you want to go buy and they um, card you, you should have a Pennsylvania ID to get the liquor. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if you don't have a Pennsylvania ID, which is legitimate for anything to get, you know, to go into clubs or anything else, if you don't have that, you shouldn't be able to buy the beer. But you say if you're 21, that's it, it's your choice. That's right. Okay, thanks for calling. Hi, you're on the air. Go ahead. So, um, I think these ads are extremely irresponsible. And the professor, I don't understand why, what his position is because he, I don't know if he lives in these inner center, center 
Lake Center neighborhoods like I do, but these ads, I see these children walking around with all of these 40 beers, okay, the children are, uh, they get drunk, there's a disproportionate number of homicides that result from these, um, um, for these um, stop and go uh, places like this, this this woman just referred to and I myself am tired of being bombarded with these negative ads they have one for instance that has a, it's called a beer and it's a beer that has uh, a large tiger holding a beer in its mouth mm -hmm. and it suggests to me that these kids drink these type of beers and have these negative attitudes mm -hmm. which perpetuates itself in these neighborhoods and I'm out for one have been tired of it for years okay and let man I, I, I admire your fervor you got to let Dr. Okay, Williams answer sorry. this. You know what? If you can keep that energy for two minutes, I'll stick you on hold while we take okay. a break, and I'll let Dr. Williams do it. Power Master Malt Liquor. Should it hit the marketplace in the first place? Reverend Jesse Brown says, no way. Dr. Jerome Williams says, the free market is just that, the free market. You're angry. You said that you think that uh, Dr. Williams... I, I have a question for you. Why is it implicit on Dr. Williams to have a position similar to yours no he doesn't have to um have a position similar to mine his um he's a right to his own opinion as i do mine but see in my opinion we have a population here that is mostly um uneducated and it is a, um, the okay. right is a, a responsibility to educate people to a positive i, I hear you that was also a point that was brought up uh in the Nightline show on this very same subject exactly, last week. Exactly, I saw that. It, uh, positive, um, okay, let Dr. Williams answer your question. Okay. Your points have been made quite well, I, I might add. Okay, well, I take issue with the caller's viewpoint about this matter of uneducated consumers. Uh, I grew up in the inner city of Philadelphia. I was born there in North Philadelphia and spent my early years there. And I collect data on inner city communities all across the country. And I reject the notion that black consumers are not responsible enough to make decisions. I've measured these decisions, I've compared these decisions with white consumers, and I've observed the sophistication that when consumers are given a choice and they understand what's there in the marketplace, they will make a prudent decision. I am not sure that your, your, your statement is 100% is accurate in that we have far more disproportionate number of advertising saying to us that somehow alcohol is good for us, it'll make us sexy, it'll make us powerful, it'll make us strong. And the alcoholic producers spend hundreds of millions of dollars putting that message out day in and day out when there is no other counter advertising that says that this is not so. But if, you know, if you've got a culture, and many people would say, if you've got a culture that by its very definition of racism puts African-American men somewhat at a distinct disadvantage already, and you've got an advertising medium that says, this will make you strong, this will make you macho, this will make you good, this will make you tough, are you not hitting him where he hurts already? My, I still maintain that people will make responsible decisions. I mean, you can take, uh, whether it's alcohol or tobacco, and I've seen groups of people that have, have values instilled through them, perhaps through churches or through community organizations or public service campaigns. They have said no to various harmful products, and I, I know that can be done. And so I'm saying we have to address the problem from the demand side rather than shifting our... Uh, efforts and putting all the responsibility on the supply side. Okay, hi, thank you for holding you around the air. Hi, I'm calling from South Jersey and I live in an area that has a lot of alcoholism and drug uh, things that are going on. And I like to say to the man, uh, not the preacher, but to the other man, we don't need any more ads like this in our neighborhood. We are a people that are going through a lot of things and we need positive images in our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. This alcohol is, is terrible. We don't need this anymore. And I'm surprised you as a black male, you know, you somehow seem to have made it. Are you supposed to look out for your younger brothers and sisters that, that are looking at these ads? If they want to spend money to do something, why don't they put an ad up there with two parents and two children instead of an alcoholic beverage? I'd like a response from you, please. If we're so concerned about these products, it's not just alcohol and tobacco. They're very visible products, and I still maintain that it's a responsibility within the community to make these decisions. If you want to talk about harmful effects, look at the high fat, high cholesterol content of fast foods. And in terms of numbers of people, there's a far more detrimental effect of all the people that go into fast food places and all the heavy advertising there. I'm saying that the problem that we're addressing here is a high visibility problem, but there are far more 
uh, prevalent problems in the community, and they, it, to me, it doesn't relate to advertising. To the, to the caller, I got a question for you. Why is it incumbent on Dr. Williams, and I ask this with all due respect, to be more defensive or more supportive of the African American community than it would be for me, for example, to be supportive of the Irish American community from which I proudly descend? Why is it his responsibility as an African American male to take a particular position in the land of the free and home of the brave? It's not so much him being an African American male, because first of all, he is a black male, and a lot of our young children don't have a black male to look up to, mm -hmm. okay? And like you say, you're from the Irish community. I can agree with that. We, as a race of people... By the way, I might also add, the Irish American community, and statistics will bear us out, has had a horrible time with alcoholism. Yes, I can Statistically, agree they're way up there. But most of these ads that you see are primarily targeted for the black area, and we don't need any more of them. We need some strong Christian advertising in our area. Okay, Reverend, you're on. What do you think? Well, I think I agree with the caller, but I think we also um, have a higher calling, and that calling is to promote and protect and to serve uh, in such a way that we uplift people and not bring them down. We don't have the right to go into any theater and yell fire because we will uh, abrogate, uh, b because I have it as a personal liberty. It jeopardizes the safety of all of those patrons that happen to be in that theater. If someone is going to jump off a building, we don't simply say, go jump. We climb on top of the building and try to talk them down. Uh, we try to remove those inducements that cause them to go up there in the first place. We have that same responsibility here. If we have a major problem, as we do with alcohol, drugs, and other things in our community, we have a responsibility to make certain that as little influence as possible impacts that okay. community. i got time for one more quick one. Thank you for holding. You're on the air. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. Uh, I was just wondering why the Reverend is just going after this beer and not Colt 45, because if this beer is prevented from coming onto the market, I think it's only going to prevent people from switching from a malt liquor to another type of malt liquor, Whereas you should try and get all the malt liquors off and have them lumped in with cigarettes and alcohol so that they can't be advertised on TV or within magazine print. Okay, got to go. What do you think, Reverend? You well, want them all off? I, I, it would be nice, but that's not what we're after here. We're after dealing with the power master, which is being introduced to the community at this point in time. And you look at a Billy D. Williams, who is the spokesman for Colt 45 for low these many years, and say what? Good for him? Well, he's, he's free to make his choice. I'm saying that the area of, of uh, concern. It was with the consumer to make informed choices. Okay. There you have it. Dr. Jerome Williams, Penn State marketing professor, and Reverend Jesse Brown, a Lutheran minister, both concerned on opposite sides of the fence, we might add, about this issue of power master malt liquor. Thank you, those of you who called. Good comments. Stay with us as A in Philadelphia continues. It may be a work... Eight. Five. Four, three. Is it ethical for marketers to target certain products for certain ethnic neighborhoods? Now, we're going to talk about the ethics of target marketing. Good morning, I'm Joe Hunter. This is Changes, and my guest is Dr. Jerome Williams. Dr. Williams is a professor of marketing at Penn State University. We'll return with our guest, Dr. Williams, right after this. <laughs> Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three. My guest, Dr. Jerome Williams, professor of marketing at Penn State University. Dr. Williams, first off, is there such a thing as a minority market? 
to begin with. Is there a minority market, per is se? There, is there such a thing as Actually, that? there is not. Mm -hmm. And that's really a misnomer, because when people talk about the minority market, you assume that there's this market out there labeled minority, composed of blacks and Hispanics and Asians. But really, if you look at those markets, there's such diversity in those markets that I've found that sometimes there's more diversity within a particular segment, say the black African-American consumer market, than the, the general market. Mm -hmm. Because when we speak of a minority market, you have to take in Asians, Hispanics, wouldn't you? And oh, yes. A minority market, typically we think of blacks, Hispanics, and Asians. Mm -hmm. But even if you take, let's say, the Hispanic market, I lived in Colorado for a number of years, and if you're targeting toward Mexican-Americans, that's vastly different than, say, targeting toward Cuban-Americans, mm -hmm. or let's say, Hispanics from South or Central America. If you're talking about blacks, if you use that as a umbrella label, you may have blacks that uh, were born in this country, you may have blacks from the Caribbean area, you may have blacks from Africa, and there may be distinct consumer differences among those various mm -hmm. groups. I would think that no matter what one personally thinks of this sort of thing, that it really is an unethical to target marketing practices in this way, or am I incorrect? In my mind, there's nothing unethical about target marketing. Mm -hmm. That's just basic marketing strategy. If you look at what marketers do, they target market all the time, mm -hmm. whether it's to young people or to women or to ethnic groups. Now, the question of ethics comes up is when we start talking about products that are known to have certain harmful effects, say like alcohol and tobacco. Then there's a question of whether we should be target marketing those particular products to a particular segment of the population where there may be an increased uh, or disproportionate uh, relationship with certain diseases related to these products. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly uh, they advertise beer, alcohol, cigarettes, what have you, all over, you know, all over the country. This goes towards uh, any community or any group, but yet in the, uh, well, let's take this business about this malt beer. Yes, the malt liquor controversy. Malt, right, the malt liquor controversy, you know, which uh, communities are raising a lot of cane about saying this is targeted specifically towards us. Isn't this being targeted towards other groups too? Most of the emphasis has been on black males and the reason for that is because of the demand. You have to realize that the beer industry, they're in a very competitive situation and they're making business decisions. They're saying to themselves, okay, who is it that drinks our beer and who are the heavy users? Mm -hmm. And if we find it among an age group, or if we find it among a particular geographic region, or if we find it in an ethnic group, then we're going to channel our advertising dollars toward that particular segment. So they're making strictly business decisions. Now there's this matter of whether they're, they are being socially responsible to do that, and that's a matter that, of course, that they have to be accountable for. But that's a rather gray area though, isn't it? That's a gray area because my position has been, okay, the matter of social and corporate responsibility, that's something for the companies to, to be concerned about. But as far as black consumers are concerned, I've always advocated personal responsibility. Mm -hmm. uh, for years, uh, within the black community, community, there have been struggles to achieve certain freedoms. You know, freedom to vote, uh, freedom to attend certain schools, uh, freedom to live in certain neighborhoods. And we also have in the marketplace freedom of choice, choice among various products. And I say that give consumers information, let them be informed, uh, let them know that certain products have a high alcohol content, certain products are a light beer, certain products uh, are harmful. This is what warning messages are for. And I feel, based on the research that I've done, that given this information, consumers can make wise and prudent decisions. Mm -hmm. I think that's what irks me about this whole thing. Uh, the implication there is that I don't have brains enough to decide <laughs> for myself yeah. whether or not to boycott this product or yeah. to buy it. And uh, that, that's what really yeah. gets me. Well, it, it does become somewhat insulting. As you are well aware, there are a number of groups that have advocated whitewashing billboards and, and uh, going and protesting in front of the beer companies and so forth. And I certainly admire the zeal of many of these groups. But I say uh, the real problem is not Power Master or the, not a particular cigarette. The problem is that we have to instill values in people and let people make choices. And I say also, as you've mentioned, that 
if you take away that choice, uh, you're in effect saying, I'm not smart enough as a consumer you mm -hmm. know, with all of these advertisements that kind of like a Pied Piper, I'm just going to mindlessly follow whatever the advertising says yeah. uh, without giving it any thought. And I don't think that's true. No, I don't either. How much economic power can black uh, consumers uh, exercise in the marketplace? Have you done any research on that? Yes, quite a, quite a bit. When you add up all of the total purchasing power of uh, black households across the country, the numbers will vary. Uh, the lowest number I've ever seen is maybe about $170 billion. And on the high end, you see numbers up around $250, $260 billion that consumers purchase annually. So what that means is that black consumers can send a message to any marketer whether it's Nike, uh, whether it's Coca-Cola, whether it's McDonald's, or whether it's an alcohol or tobacco company, they can say, with this purchasing dollar, with my purchasing vote, this is what I demand for my money. Mm -hmm. And so in the economic exchange, you know, we've traditionally thought that it stops at the cash register. I go in and I buy a product and I get the product and I hand over my money to the retailer, which goes to the manufacturer. But we're living in an era now where people are expecting more. They're expecting uh, some sort of response from the manufacturer that says, okay, and in return for my purchasing dollar, I also want you to be responsible. So I say that's the best way to send a message back to the suppliers of products that are deemed harmful. Mm -hmm. What about now the, the inner city occupant as compared to the so-called middle class? I mean, is, is there a different approach there or not? Well, there are a lot of differences. Uh, I've done a lot of my research on middle class black consumers. And if you look at traditional marketing research and the study of the consumer market, the assumption has been that all blacks uh, think alike and buy products similarly, uh, et cetera. And that's not true at all. Mm -hmm. You see a lot of diversity. And in certain instances, uh, I found that uh, upscale, middle class black, sometimes you hear this expression, the buppy, the black urban professional, the, you know, you hear the term with the yuppie, the young urban professional, you will find uh, black urban professionals uh, demonstrating purchasing behavior very similar to their white counterparts at that socioeconomic level. That is, there may be a greater difference between uh, middle and upscale blacks mm -hmm. and lower income blacks than there is between, let's say, middle and upscale blacks and middle and upscale white consumers. Which is a very important point and interesting too because I think that's what Spike Lee was trying to show in Jungle Fever, his film. And I don't think any of the reviewers got that at all. Yes, I think there are a lot of messages that Spike Lee was trying to, to get across, and that's certainly one of them. And he's addressed this in other, many of the other yeah, films, yeah. too, uh, the, the diversity within blacks. I think it was in school days, yeah. and certainly, yeah. uh, for sure. Okay, we'll pause for a message and return with our guest, Dr. Jerome Williams, right after this. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three. Back with our guest, Dr. Jerome Williams, professor of marketing at Penn State University. You know, I hear this complaint many times that uh, Afro-American uh, radio newspapers, etc., shouldn't take ads for alcohol and tobacco. And you know, that's an amusing thing to me, to hear someone say that, because that's a business too, these various media outlets. And uh, they're gathering in big advertising dollars for these ads, be they deleterious or not. And uh, how do you feel about that, the role of the black media, so-called? Well, that, that's a, from their standpoint, it's a business decision. And as an advocate of choice in the marketplace, I think those businesses are free to make choices. Mm -hmm. If I were running a business, I might make the decision not to accept advertising for alcohol and tobacco products. And each owner and entrepreneur has to make that decision, just as the owner of the small corner grocery store has to make a decision what kinds of products that they are going to carry. Mm -hmm. uh, one person might decide, I don't want to carry cigarettes mm -hmm. in my store. But the one thing I, I think that relates to this is sometimes you hear people uh, charge that there's an element of racism in this, of just targeting these products in the black community. Really, it's a, it's a business decision. Because if you think about if it's racism, 
they're using the black media primarily to advertise these products. Many of the black-owned ad agencies are developing the ads. The black store owners are carrying the products. There are black marketers working for the companies that are producing the products. So there are many black African Americans that are also involved in this. Uh, but they're doing it from a business standpoint. It has nothing to do, in my mind, with racism. Yeah. Let's take a look at blacks in advertising. Uh, do you feel that uh, there should be more blacks used in advertising? Uh, certainly, certainly. If you look at the history of blacks in advertising for many years, particularly in the 40s and 50s, there were very few blacks featured in ads. And at the time when you did see blacks featured in ads, many times they were in very subservient roles, let's say. They were, say, a train porter or a, a bellman or something of that nature. And many of the caricatures of blacks in advertising were similar to the Aunt Jemima or the Uncle Ben's Rice type of caricature. So we've seen a lot of progress from those days. And part of that has to do with that we've seen more blacks get into advertising, not only black-owned ad agencies, but also blacks that are working for the mainstream ad agencies who have been able to uh, insert some influence in there to make the ads and the imagery that's portrayed much more positive than we've seen, let's say, 20, 30 years ago. Yeah. What, what about black English, you know, used in some of these ads? How do you feel about that? Well, that's a, that's a very controversial topic. We're doing a study right now where we're trying to measure the use of language in advertising, and we use different types of black English. And there are many people that will say that black English is the equivalent of bad English. Mm -hmm. And others will say that black English is nothing more than a different dialect, dialect than from mainstream English, just as there is a, there's a southern dialect and there's a New England dialect, et cetera. And so we should accept it as just a different form of, of English. Well, we're not trying to evaluate that debate. What we're trying to say is, OK, if we inject black English in advertising, and we use certain slang expressions and certain grammatical expressions. And sometimes people refer to this as what they call the right on school of advertising, mm -hmm. where the advertiser tries to be real hip and to uh, communicate that to the, to the uh, consumer. And you see a lot of singing and dancing and things of that nature. Uh, we're just trying to evaluate the response. And what we found so far, going back to my comment earlier, is that there's a great deal of diversity and variability some people will respond very positively to that. I mean, black consumers and other black consumers will respond very negatively. Let's take rap music as an example. You see a lot of commercials where they try to use, uh, say, rap music mm. in the commercial. Yeah. I had both young and old black consumers respond both positively and negatively. And so you have to do a lot of pre-testing and understand your target market to see what's going to work most effectively with which group you're trying to appeal to. Do you feel that... Uh marketers should be more sensitive to the needs insofar as, or you know, sensitivity insofar as approaching the, the black consumer? Yeah, that's a big area because uh, so many ads that I see where advertisers have created mistakes, it's been because of insensitivity. And part of that goes back to one of the questions you asked a minute ago, should there be more blacks in advertising? Mm -hmm. Because many times when you don't have blacks in advertising that understand these subtle differences and what things can offend, uh, you find marketers and advertisers making these mistakes, perhaps uh, using a particular expression that's not acceptable, perhaps using uh, blacks in such a way that it appears as being a tokenistic effort, perhaps uh, using blacks in a certain picture arrangement that conveys a very negative imagery. For instance, there was an ad where they used a black hand and a white hand handcuffed together. And the theme was to try and promote unity and harmony, racial harmony, but with the handcuffs, with the symbolism of bondage and slavery and uh, perhaps a white policeman locking up a, a black criminal, the whole campaign really just backfired. Just went out the window. Yeah, <laughs> had a very negative effect yeah. on black consumers. Yeah. I guess what I'm driving at, though, is it the business of the marketer to uh, display this kind of sensitivity? You know, he's, he's not thinking in terms of anything but the dollar. Well, that's right. They, they're making business decisions, but you have to realize that if you make a bad business decision based on sensitivity, it does have an effect on your bottom line or on your profit. Mm -hmm. So even though advertisers and marketers are not necessarily in the business of being uh, social advocates or pushing certain rights, if they do something that alienates a particular group, whether it's women or whether it's an ethnic group, and they incur, let's say, a boycott of their product. The instance with uh, Operation Push and Nike, 
then it starts to affect the cash register and then they have to basically be more sensitive. Mm -hmm. So if you really want to hurt businesses uh, in the place where it really make, draws their attention, it's to do it by not buying their product. That's perhaps the strongest message you can send to the marketer. Mm -hmm. What is your personal opinion about this new malt beer or whatever it's called? Powerhouse or something? Power Master. Yeah, Power, Power Master. Master. I mean, what, what's your opinion about the kind of uh, targeting that they're doing with this? Okay. Well, first of all, let me say that I don't drink beer. Mm -hmm. But I don't impose my viewpoint as a non-drinker of beer on you or anybody else. I don't smoke. But I don't impose my viewpoint on you not to smoke. I've made certain choices. I feel you have to make certain choices. And all black consumers have to make certain choices. So I say that if the Heilman Brewing Company has a beer like that, and it's a high alcohol content, that's a business decision that they've made, I don't have to buy that beer. Mm -hmm. And if the black community doesn't want it in the black community, as a group, through the efforts of education and being informed about the detrimental effects, the black community can send that message to Heilman not to market that beer in the community. Mm -hmm. And I think whether it's beer or whether it's uh, tobacco products or whether it's high fat hamburgers at fast food places or whatever the product might be, once you instill values in people, then they can make informed decisions no matter what the product is. Right. We'll pause for a message, return with our guest, Dr. Jerome Williams, right after this. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three. Back with our guest, Dr. Jerome Williams, professor of marketing at Penn State University. What exactly did you find out in your research, if you did check this particular aspect? What do or what does the black community expect from marketers in advertising? Yeah. I think there are two things. One we've touched on. One is to be sensitive, and the second is to avoid stereotypes. And if advertisers recognize those two rules, I think that goes a long way in toward being effective. But let me also add that we're this is a changing climate. Mm -hmm. And what's right today may not be necessarily right tomorrow. Let me give an example. What do you call the black consumer market? Uh, right now, there's a lot of controversy as to whether the term African-American consumer or black consumer. There have been a lot of studies done. But that's constantly changing. I'm seeing the studies you know, every month giving different figures. But these are things that marketers need to stay on top. Uh, just terminology and certainly effective marketing strategy and uh, it's not something that once you do research today, that's going to be good for the next 10 years. Yeah. You uh, mentioned that uh, there's, a, I think it was an advertising campaign that you saw that had to do with, uh, I think, a family. It yes. showed a mother and two kids. Right, and right. Uh, on the other hand, it was a father and a mother. Right. It was Tell a campaign where there was a public assistance agency was trying to direct uh, an advertising effort to make funds available and they target marketed. Mm -hmm. They had one brochure for uh, a white community and one brochure for the black community. But on the brochure directed toward the white community there was a mother, father, and two children. But on the brochure for the black community there was just the mother and the two children. Well the message was that all families in the black community are single parent with a female head of household and that was certainly being insensitive and stereotyping and they really should not have tried to depict the black family that way if they were being more sensitive and understanding and recognize the effects that it has in terms of the message that they're conveying. Did, uh, did that campaign go down the tubes as a result well, of Well eventually that? they changed it. Uh, they oh had they to, did? They had to change the, the picture. And that, that typically happens. You know, a marketer will go out and do something and they think they're being effective and once they get the response from the community then they may have to recall the ad or redo it. Mm -hmm. uh, the same thing happened with the, the black hand and the white hand. Uh, what eventually happened and I saw a, a follow-up ad and they showed the same theme, a black hand and a white hand, but this time 
uh, they were passing a baton, so now they were showing teamwork working together, mm -hmm. but they took away the chain imagery, et cetera. Do you think somebody got to them and told them, hey, look, this oh, is yes. not the way yes. to go, you know? Yes. The, when, when advertisers put those ads out in the marketplace, there's a, always a lot of response. In fact, there's an organization in New York, and I think there's one here in Philadelphia, too. The one in New York that I'm familiar with is called MOTAP, uh, Media Offensive to African American People, and they monitor all types of ads and movies and films and TV programs, and they let advertisers know if they think there's something insensitive or stereotypical in the messages that they're perceiving. Mm -hmm. You feel then, and we're winding up now, that uh, perhaps it's not the job of the well, let's say the marketer to really be that concerned about these things. Uh, I know we have a black minister who's highly against this and feels that it is a moral problem there and should be addressed in that way. Well, I'm not saying that it's not the responsibility of the marketers. Uh, don't misperceive or con misconstrue that I'm saying that, okay, the marketers have no responsibility. Indeed, they do have a responsibility, but I'm saying we as a black community should not shift the blame the totally time. on them. Right. We have to be accountable for our own right. and, and make our own decisions. Sure. Okay, our guest, Dr. Jerome Williams, professor of marketing from Penn State University. I'm Joe Hunter. Good morning. <laughs>